good morning, everyone. Um, so as uh, Anthony said, we'll be talking about um, our brain system and basically how we hear and what goes wrong with hearing loss and why it's actually a brain problem. So to, to start, we need to just understand what is the goal of hearing? What is sound? It's to, uh, it's to detect and um, understand sound. So what are the properties of sound? Right here, we have a uh, what's called a spectrogram. This is a visual representation of my voice showing the three fundamental properties of sound. On the vertical axis, we have the different frequency components of sound, which would be like the different notes on a piano. And then the darkness of each of these frequency components would be how hard I'm hitting these, each of these notes on the piano, the loudness. And then along the x-axis is time, because sound does not exist in a single instant. Sound occurs over time. And so that would be like the melody played on a piano. But we, we take hearing for granted sometimes, and we don't really appreciate how crucial it is to, to our life until we begin to lose it. And the World Health Organization has found that uh, over 1 in 20 of the global population has some form of a disabling hearing loss. And that statistic is thought to uh, increase and double by uh, the year 2050. So it's really becoming a, a global epidemic, really. Uh, and, and this is something that's also associated with age, where one in three individuals over age 65 are uh, thought to have a disabling hearing loss. And this is not just an issue of not being able to hear, it, it leads to greater problems, because when it's hard to hear, you start to withdraw from social interactions. You might not go to a noisy restaurant because you can't have a conversation. And when you do that, you start to withdraw from social life and um, do not interact with people anymore, and that can that sort of social withdrawal is linked to um, poor cognitive functioning and can lead to uh, issues like dementia. There have been associations shown there. So it's, it's uh, good to understand what is going on in the brain with hearing loss and why we should try to prevent it from occurring in the first place. So this diagram here, you know, how do we hear? So the, these two uh, images here are actually showing my voice saying basil and basil. And you can see it's very similar, but I'm saying the same word. And they've and I bet most of you can probably tell that I'm saying the same word with a different accent. And much like a prism, we'll take uh, the spectrum of light and split it into all the different wavelengths or colors of light. The cochlea in the inner ear uh, takes the different frequency components of sound and splits it up into their individual components for the brain to interpret. So that's happening in the inner ear here. So first, sound funnels through the ear canal and hits the eardrum, and these pressure waves vibrate the middle ear bones which then causes the fluid within the cochlea to vibrate. If we were to uh, open up that cochlea and look inside, what we see is this amazing spiral, uh, spiral space here that is filled with cells. And if we zoom in further and further, kind of like a detective TV show here, we can see these little hairs here sticking up on the surface of the spiraling epithelium here. These are called the hair cells that you may have heard of that vibrate with sound. And these hair cells do not just detect sound indiscriminately, they're actually organized with respect to frequency, that different frequencies will vibrate different portions of this uh, surface, um, such that high frequencies will vibrate the hair cells in one region here, low frequencies will vibrate the hair cells in another region, and then that information is sent to the brain. And when sounds become too loud, this is the first point where damage occurs. Those hair cells become disorganized or broken and can no longer interpret sound. And our next speaker will uh, tell you a bit more about that. So how do these hair cells work? What they do is they, they vibrate back and forth with a sound wave, and that ends up opening these sort of uh, mechanotransduction channels that cause a chemical cascade to occur, which translates that sound pressure energy into an electrical signal or a nerve impulse. That nerve impulse is then carried by the auditory nerve, which would be these green fibers here contacting the bottom of these cells, and that signal is brought to the brain. So sound begins in the cochlea, hearing begins in the cochlea, I should say, but really hearing ends in the brain. So the cochlea picks up the physical attributes of sound, the spectral content, loudness, timing, but it is the brain that interprets those signals and finds meaning. Where, where did the sound occur? What is the sound? Is it predator or prey? And so the analogy I like to use is that the cochlea and the hair cells are kind of like an antenna. Their, their, their job is just to pick up the signals, but it's the brain that is the receiver to dial into the signal you want to hear. Do you want to hear my voice? Do you want to hear the air conditioner in the background? Uh, do you want to hear the siren passing by in the street? All those sounds are coming at you at the same time, 
and it's your brain's job to pick those apart and identify them as different sounds. <clears throat> but with hearing loss, we have difficulty doing this. The main thing we think of with hearing loss is that there's a reduced sensitivity. Maybe you start to lose your high frequency hearing, for instance. Then we have other funny phenomena that occur, like hyperacusis, where some sounds become painfully loud at levels where they wouldn't normally be loud for most people. And there's also tinnitus, or phantom sounds, where you're starting to hear a sound that isn't actually there in the real world. It's your brain creating the, uh, the, the perception of a sound. It can be quite annoying. Uh, and then there can be issues of just difficulty in dis discriminating between different frequencies. You might not be able to tell the difference between two adjacent notes on a piano. And these issues we cannot fully explain by pathologies of the inner ear. So that's why we are turning our attention to the brain. Because these problems appear to be issues that arise in the brain due to a hearing loss. So in, in essence, you know, when we talk about what is the problem, as Anthony was describing, the initial problem occurs in the cochlea, that there may be a deficit in the, uh, in the uh, reception of sound, but the, the subsequent problems occur in the brain, that the brain changes and we can no longer interpret sound correctly. So where does this occur? So the brain has uh, many complex pathways that are involved with uh, processing sound, where first it arrives at the cochlea, is sent to the brain via the auditory nerve, and eventually is processed through various stations all the way up into the cerebral cortex where we are then aware of the sound, where we perceive the sound. Now, I'm not going to go into details of the circuit because there's certainly not enough time for that. But what we are beginning to understand is that problems occur in the circuitry when there is no longer sound input due to, say, deafness or acquired hearing loss. And the main themes that we see are that with deafness, these brain pathways fail to develop normally and that with acquired hearing loss, these brain pathways also appear to atrophy and or become disorganized with time. And so to give one example of how that might occur, we're going to look at uh, an extreme case of, of congenital deafness. And we're going to look at one of the nerve endings of the auditory nerve. So this is the first input to the brain from the cochlea. So what we have here is a schematic of the cochlear nucleus where each of these little black strings here would be an auditory nerve fiber coming in to the brain and synapsing on various cells throughout the structure here. And in particular, we're going to look at one particular nerve ending called the end bulb of hell, which is an enormous uh, synapse that surrounds a cell called a bushy cell, shown here in blue. This is one of the largest synapses in the brain and is essential for precise timing of sound signals to allow us to detect the locations of sound accurately um, and detect very small differences in the arrival of sound between our two ears. And what our lab has found over the years is that this structure is very sensitive to changes in input, that is, whether the auditory nerve is working or not. So, you know, we see this very complex, elaborate structure, this kind of arborization of synaptic, of this uh, synapse here, that's filled with hundreds, thousands of synaptic endings that contact the cell. But in mice with hearing loss, we find that the structure seems to atrophy over time such that there are fewer contacts happening with the, uh, with the recipient bushy cell. And those changes not don't just occur on the macro level, they also occur on the synaptic level. So if we were to cut into the cell here and look at a very small piece of it with an electron microscope, we could actually look at the synapses here. So this is the point of communication between an axon and a cell. And we can see that these synapses here are changing in their morphology from kind of a small curved shape into a longer flattened shape. And this appears to change the way the cells communicate uh, between each other. And what we found is that this definitely has something to do with sound arriving to the ear and being transduced to the brain or not. So in congenitally deaf white cats, which is one of the model species we have studied in the past, we have seen these changes. That with normal hearing, you have this complex, elaborate structure. And with congenital deafness, you can see that the structure becomes atrophied and the synapses change. But what if we were to restore activity to the auditory nerve through something called a cochlear implant invented here in Australia? So if we were to give a cochlear implant to a cat, um, and it's not implanted in the same way because your skull is not quite the same size, um, but it is a human cochlear implant that this cat has received. And if we give that implant at a young age, when the cat is still developing, we find that those uh, end bolts here start to look normal. So if we were to basically correct the deafness by restoring activity, we can restore these end bulbs 
uh, to a more normal morphology, suggesting that they are correctly processing sound information. What if we were to wait until six months, which is kind of past the point of juvenile development for these, for these cats, we don't see that same sort of rescue. So that's similar to whether we should give a cochlear implant to a child at a young age or wait until they're an adult. So that's just one example of how the brain responds to experience, um, sound experience, whether it is there or not, and, and shows the, the critical need for our ability to have normal hearing function to basically exercise our brain and maintain our ability to hear correctly. So essentially to wrap up, what are we doing with this? The, the first thing is to educate the public to protect their ears from loud noises. You know, prevention is the best medicine as in all things, so trying to avoid traumatic sound is the first line of defense. Uh, but uh, our lab's trying to understand how hearing loss affects brain circuits that allow us to discriminate sounds in quiet noises and to try to understand where things like tinnitus uh, begin to originate from because it is a problem within the brain but we don't quite understand where yet. And we also want to study circuits that can allow us to amplify certain sounds, i.e. attention. And lastly, try to understand if restoring hearing may prevent some of these abnorm abnormalities uh, down the track through, say, hearing aids or cochlear implants. And with that, I will then turn it over to Kira, a, a student in our lab.